Welcome and thank you for taking the time to watch the following presentation on reverse transcription quantitative PCR. My name is Gillian Brown and I'm the Global Market Development Scientist for our Gene Editing and Novel Modalities team, supporting our gene editing tools and the workflows in which these tools are used, including molecular biology. During this presentation, I will briefly introduce quantitative PCR technology and steps you can take to improve your qPCR based experiments. I will then give a brief overview of the fundamentals of reverse transcription qPCR, some common issues that can occur while performing RT qPCR, and highlight how reagents like Thermostop RT can help enhance your RT PCR results. Please feel free to submit questions during the presentation, and we will follow up with you via email afterwards. So to kick things off here, let's start with a brief review of some of the basics. So real-time PCR, also known as real-time quantitative or qPCR, determines the actual amount of PCR product present at a given cycle. This process allows you to measure DNA generation in the qPCR assay, and the intensity of the fluorescence indicates the quantity of PCR product present. Researchers perform qPCR to accurately quantify expression of genes or DNA sequences in a particular sample. Gene expression is a common application for qPCR and is measured by the number of copies of an RNA transcript. Amplification through RT qPCR is necessary to detect and quantify gene expression from small amounts of RNA. Real time qPCR or quantitative qPCR falls under two categories. CyberGreen or probe-based detection. CyberGreen-based detection uses CyberGreen 1 dye, which binds to double-stranded DNA to detect PCR product. This method will detect all amplified double-stranded DNA, including non-specific reaction products. Probe-based detection uses a fluorogenic probe to enable the detection of a specific PCR product and detects specific amplification products only. Researchers can choose to use CyberGreen over probe-based detection because it is more affordable and enables the monitoring of amplification of any double-stranded DNA sequence. In addition, multiple dyes can bind to a single amplified molecule which increases sensitivity for detecting amplification products. The disadvantage to CyberGreen detection is that the dye itself can be an inhibitor. It can also bind to non-specific DNA sequences and sometimes lead to false positives. Probe-based qPCR may be the method of choice for a researcher when specificity is the most important thing. The hybridization between the probe and the target is required to generate fluorescence, which can significantly reduce background noise and false positives. It is possible to label these probes with different distinguishable reporter dyes, which allows researchers to amplify two distinct sequences in a single reaction tube. The major disadvantage to probe-based detection includes the cost, and the fact that each target sequence requires a different probe. In terms of how the expression of genes is analyzed, this graph shows a typical qPCR curve or output from the qPCR machine. As you can see, the fluorescence is graphed against the number of cycles. The CT value or cycle threshold value is shown with a green line, highlighting the point where the curve clearly rises off the baseline to a statistically significant degree. Higher sensitivity of reagents can lead to lower CT values, which can be valuable for researchers, particularly when assaying genes or targets that are expressed at very low levels. Something that's often asked is, do you have any tips for successful qPCR? So described here are some tips and tricks that you might find useful. You should always test your primers using a standard curve. This test is important for two main reasons. Firstly, it ensures that the primers detect efficiently and precisely their target, which is critical for a good qPCR experiment. Secondly, it can tell you the detection limit, which can help determine the appropriate amount of DNA to use in the following experiments. For example, why would you use 10 nanograms per reaction when you can use only one nanogram and save your precious sample for future work? Additionally, to help with precision, you should do sequential dilutions and pipette the same volume of DNA in each reaction. Another tip is to use water only as one of the negative controls, which can help detect contaminants in the reaction, as well as discriminate your test sample from background levels of amplification. 
And finally, making sure your DNA is high quality, i.e. having intact DNA at an appropriate concentration with a good 260-280 ratio will be helpful. When thinking about the best way to approach qPCR experiments, another resource you might want to consider are the Mikey guidelines. These guidelines were published by an international research team in 2009 to address the challenges of performing dependable qPCR. Mikey guidelines ask for the minimum information necessary to allow the reproduction and quality assessment of a given qPCR-based experiment. The information requested can be divided into experimental design, sample properties, nucleic acid extraction and quality assessment, reverse transcription, target information, primer and probe details, qPCR protocol optimization, and validation details, as well as data analysis. Move Moving forward now to take a closer look at RT-PCR or reverse transcription PCR, this is another PCR technique that amplifies RNA. Because DNA polymerase cannot amplify single-stranded DNA, reverse transcription is necessary to create cDNA from an RNA template. Then that cDNA is amplified using standard PCR or possibly qPCR protocols as described in previous slides. Thinking about reverse transcription, there are a number of different RT enzymes that can be utilized, and I'd like to describe some of those here. MMLV is a preferred enzyme for longer transcripts and reduces RNA's H activity. AMV is a common enzyme that has higher thermostability and is ideal for transcripts with difficult secondary structures. Enhanced AMV is engineered for higher temperatures, difficult secondary structures, as well as low abundance templates. There are two different types of RT-PCR, either the one-step or two-step methods. One-step RT-PCR is a great option for researchers who want easy and fast RT-PCR. This method involves easy handling and minimizes the risk of contamination, since both reverse transcription and PCR are performed in the same tube. On the other hand, two-step is preferred by researchers who require more sensitive and potentially efficient options. Buffers can be optimized for independent reverse transcription and PCR steps. And conveniently, this method also allows researchers to store cDNA for extended periods of time. However, this process requires more pipetting steps and can be more time consuming. Even when you plan your experiments well and set everything up carefully, there can still be some issues that you don't anticipate and solutions to some of the most common concerns are described here. Poor or no signal may occur when there is an inhibitor present. To combat this, perform a dilution series of the PCR template. This will help determine if you can reduce the effect of the inhibitor. In addition, you can use at least three millimoles of magnesium chloride or a real-time PCR master mix to avoid poor signal. Also, adjusting the minimum extension time to 30 seconds for genomic DNA and 15 seconds for cDNA can assist in avoiding poor signal. Another concern can be seeing a signal in a negative control. In this scenario, contamination is often the culprit. To avoid this, use a solution of 10% bleach instead of ethanol to prepare your workstation. Use PCR-grade water and only use it for PCR. And use a no-template control to verify the absence of contaminant. Another tip is to treat samples with purified RNAs-free DNAs before the reverse transcription steps. Lastly, poor re reproducibility is another common issue for RT-QPCR. Primer dimers can be avoided by reducing primer concentration, by evaluating primer sequences for complementarity and secondary structure, and redesigning the primers if necessary. Finally, a melt curve analysis can help to determine if primer dimers are present. The majority of standard PCR is now done using a hot start method to keep TAC inactive until it reaches reaction temperatures. In contrast, the vast majority of reverse transcription to date has been done without hot start, even though reverse transcriptases have significant activity at room temperature and even below. Due to this activity at low temperature and the high stability of DNA-RNA hybrids, Primers intended to be gene-specific may hybridize with undesired targets that are partially complementary, leading to non-specific amplification. This problem is increased substantially when multiple primers are included for multiplex or TPCR. 
To address common problems with RT-PCR, here is a recommended PCR additive to increase specificity and minimize non-specific amplification. Thermostop RT, a PCR additive made by Thermogenics Inc. and distributed by Millipore Sigma, is a simple-to-use reagent for one-step or two-step RT-PCR initiated with gene-specific primers. Thermostop RT interacts with reverse transcriptase at low temperatures to inhibit enzyme activity that can lead to nonspecific products. By eliminating these errors, Thermostop RT significantly increases the yield of desired specific products and increases assay sensitivity. Reverse transcriptase activity increases at temperatures above 45 degrees Celsius, enabling transcription of the desired RNA sequence. To show the impact of thermostop RT, both one-step and two-step RT-PCR protocols for monoplex RT-PCR were tested. Figure 1 shows the endpoint fluorescent signals from a hybridization probe. The results indicate that for either one-step or two-step PCR, over three times as much of the HCV amplification product was generated in samples containing thermostop RT. A large decrease in the amount of non-specific PCR product is also observed in samples containing thermostop RT. Figure 2 shows the cyber green fluorescent derivative from the post-PCR melt of the two-step RT-PCR experiment above. Samples containing thermostop RT, in, in shown in purple lines, have a single melt peak at 85 degrees Celsius, detecting the melting of the HCV-specific amplification product. In contrast, samples without thermostop RT, shown by blue lines, have a much smaller melting peak at 85 degrees Celsius, consistent with reduced specific amplification, and have additional non-specific product peaks. A test was developed for the detection of a viroid that infects palm trees. The viroid is an infectious circular RNA that has extremely high secondary structure, posing a challenge for RT-PCR. A synthetic RNA with the viroid sequence was generated using in vitro translation. The mitochondrial NAD5 transcript, which is transpliced from different regions of the mitochondrial DNA, was used as a control for successful RT-PCR in the assay. The viroid RNA was serially diluted and mixed with a constant concentration of palm leaf RNA. One step or TPCR in the presence or absence of thermostop or T was done using non-symmetric gene-specific primers, prime script reverse transcriptase from Takara and platinum tag polymerase from Invitrogen. Figure one shows the relative fluorescent signals from the viroid probe following or TPCR. The signals which reflect the quantity of amplification product of the reaction are significantly higher in samples with thermostop or T. That difference is highest in samples with low RNA concentrations. Gel electrophoresis of the RT-PCR products of samples with only palm leaf RNA, only viroid RNA, or both is shown in figure two. Samples without thermostop or T show faint viroid product bands and high levels of non-specific products, while only the strongly stained specific product bands are detected in samples with thermostop or T. For more information on thermostop or T and other PCR additives from thermogenics used to minimize non-specific DNA amplification, please visit sigma.com forward slash thermogenics. And with that, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar. I hope that you have a greater understanding of the principles of reverse transcription quantitative PCR and how you can incorporate this technology into your workflow. If you have any questions, please feel free to either contact us via the information provided on the slide or visit our website at sigma.com forward slash PCR. Thank you and have a great day.